Thank you so much for being here. If you guys could go ahead and make your way to your seats, we will begin shortly.
All right, if we could all grab a seat, we'd love to get started. All right, welcome to everyone to an event that we have not had in three years. The fact that we're all here together, let's give ourselves a round of applause. All right, I've already had three people from the staff tell me that I cannot give all the speeches that I want to give because this is not about anything but our five honorees, right? So we're going to cut this short, although just know it's merciful because uh, there is so much to talk about, uh, beginning with the fact that it's been three years since we've all been together, beginning also with the fact that tonight we're going to be giving out 10, 000, over 10,000 degrees to our students for the first time together in the stadium in four years, which is remarkable. We just finished a Regents meeting and um, we just concluded it. Uh, and I want you to know that uh, we're going to send everyone here a copy of the transcript because the, the uh, relevant chairs of the committees all talked about what's going on at the university. And in lieu of me bragging about it for the next 20 to 25 minutes, I'm going to ask you as a matter of good faith that you take that transcript and read all of it and then send in the appropriate donation. All right, I want to do a few um, uh, uh, recognitions of guests. This is a dinner that sometimes, a lunch that sometimes turned into a dinner. Um, we don't want to do that. Um, I, I love that. That's right. I, I've already heard, heard once. Um, and so, so I want to introduce just a few of the guests. Everyone here is remarkably special. Um, I'm going to introduce in groups. So I'll go through it, and then let's recognize those that are introduced. And I want to begin... Uh, and I'm not just sucking up because they're my bosses. I'm also sucking up because they're my bosses. Um, but they are absolutely remarkable group of regents, true trustees, and board members that are making a huge difference in the life of this university. I'll call each of you, please stand up, and then we'll applaud at the end. Uh, there's the chair, former Governor Frank Keating. We have vice chair, Natalie Shirley. Regent, Eric Stevenson. Regent Anita Holloway, Regent Rick Nagel, and our newest present board member, Regent Bob Ross. Let's hear it for them. And then in a category all by himself, the only person to get their own category today, and you'll know it's the right thing when I tell you who it is, let's please welcome former board member, former regent, namesake of a college, former regent Max Weisenhofer, past recipient. We also have a few past honorary degree recipients, in addition to Max Weisenhofer, that are here. Uh, they are three legends, and we're so thrilled to have them here. It's truly an honor. Let's begin with Harold Hamm. Thank you, Harold. We just got to honor Harold and did an entire evening for him, so we'll also send you that transcript. Uh, George Henderson and his wife, Barbara. George is a legend and hero. Uh, and then someone we all think about as being the godfather of OU. I referred to uh, Joe Castiglione earlier today as our godfather, but the real one is Gene Rainbolt. Please recognize Gene Rainbolt. So after we have lunch, we're going to go through and do a deep dive on each of the five honorary degree recipients. Uh, but I would ask that each of them stand and that we recognize them. Uh, we're going to be, again, having uh, their amazing examples of who we all want to be and want our students to be. Um, the five here, Jim Mulva. Of course, we have Lynn Riggs, uh, and he is being honored posthumously. Uh, Susan Stroman. Someone everyone knows, J.C. Watts. Uh, 
And one of the best parts of this job is you get to influence uh, certain roles, including commencement speaker. Uh, he's someone that I've been a fan of for a very long time. Uh, not only is he um, a receiver of the honorary degree, he's also our commencement speaker. Please welcome David Brooks. All right, before we go to lunch, uh, we have a, a few groups of students to recognize. Uh, we will not go through the entire event tonight that we're going to handle at graduation, but there are a few of them with us here. A couple said they had finals still to do, so if you need to leave, leave. <laughs> we're going to recognize you first. In this class of 2022, we had a record number of four-point students. These are the individuals that irritate everyone else they know for a lifetime. <laughs> Um, would all of the students that are here that have maintained a perfect 4.0 GPA throughout their academic career please stand to be recognized? It seems excessive. <laughs> right. I would also like to recognize uh, the, the highly competitive national scholarships and fellowships. I'll call each of them, please stand, and we'll applaud for you all at the end. Uh, the first is the Boren Scholar, Elizabeth Basazzi. We have two Fulbright Scholars, Taylor Cousins and Liliana Ruiz. Marcia. That's Liliana Reeves Macias. I apologize for the gross mispronunciation. Well done. Um, and then we have uh, two Goldwater Scholars. We weren't able to recognize one of these individuals last year, uh, so we'll do it now. 2021 Goldwater Scholar, uh, Anna Hita Irvin. And the 2022 Goldwater Scholar, Maya Farrell. And finally, the Udall Scholar, Taylor Broadbent. All right, let's give them one last round of applause. You make us so proud. And a final group, uh, a grouping of, of amazing students. I'll just list them. Please stand when I call the organization you're with. But among our students, we have our outstanding seniors as designated. Uh, we have the Crimson Club Seniors, Payette Seniors, Commencement Committee Student Representatives, the College Banner Carriers, and the Elected Student Government Leaders. Uh, would you all please stand and be recognized. All right, there's so much more I want to say, but I'm going to honor what I said I would do. Let's now turn to lunch, enjoy each other's company, and then we'll return uh, for the actual purpose of this event and recognize our honorary degree recipients. Thank you. All right, please continue eating, but we will uh, begin the program right now. I want you to know that uh, hopefully your conversations have gone well. At our table, um, the chair of the Board of Regents was having a conversation telling Parker Primrose, who's a student, about secrets to success. And he was talking to Harold Hamm, and he was talking to, to Regent Keating, the chair of our board, and the chair of the board leaned over and goes, you know, the key to success is something Joe's learned. And he looked at me, and he goes, uh, just, he goes, Joe has surrounded himself with everyone that's smarter than him. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, okay, but it does seem a little insulting <laughs> because it's so true. Um,
Hey, hopefully you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, we have a program to go through, and I couldn't be more excited about it. Uh, this is the Honorary Degree Luncheon, and um, they're awarded at the University of Oklahoma to recognize extraordinary achievements and, of course, outstanding contributions to the university, the state, the nation, and the world. We awarded our first honorary degrees in May of 1991. And that class, I think, is, uh, was a good warm-up class to get things started. In that class, we had U.S. Representative uh, Carl Albert, Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher, President George Lynn Cross, and Helen Walton. So a good solid start to a program. <laughs> Including this year's recipient, we will have honored uh, 142 remarkable people. When you look at that list of individuals, I hope we realize the significance of what we're awarding today. They include some of the university's biggest champions, like Peggy Stevenson, Bill Saxon, <clears throat> Randall Stevenson, and those who've made an invaluable difference to the University of Oklahoma, our state, and our nation, like George Henderson, to whom we referred earlier, Governor Bill Anatubby, Ambassador Ed Perkins, and those whose accomplishment demonstrate what's possible with an OU education. And just picking out a few of my friends, Anthony Shadid, Beth Garrett, and Bill Paul. There are limestone pavers, which will add five new pavers after this event, in the Conoco uh, Leadership Courtyard that bears the names of each honorary degree recipient. Today we have five new recipients. I invite you now to turn your attention to the screen as Nicole Campbell, Dean of the University College, presents a video introduction of our first recipient, Mr. James Mulva. Jim Mulva's dedication to service, leadership, and business can only be rivaled by his dedication to giving back. Although he has called Wisconsin home for much of his life, Jim's path to success was in part born right here at the University of Oklahoma, where he was a member of the Naval Reserve Officers Training Corps, an experience he credits with teaching him how to excel in his careers in the military and the private sector. After two years in the OU Naval ROTC program in the early 1960s, Jim continued his education, ultimately earning an MBA. He was commissioned as a lieutenant junior grade and served our country for four years as a U.S. Naval officer. He then began what was to be an almost four decades long career with Phillips Petroleum and ConocoPhillips, culminating in his appointment as chairman and CEO from 1999 until his retirement in 2012. He's earned distinguished praise from around the world during his career. He was selected as the International Petroleum Executive of the Year in 2002, along with many other industry awards. He's even received honors from King Harold V of Norway and was awarded the Order of St. Gregory from the Vatican. Without question, Jim's professional endeavors are to be admired but it is the sincere desire that he and his wife Miriam share to give back to the places and organizations that shape their life story that has made the biggest impact. In 2018, Jim and Miriam pledged a transformational $20 million gift in support of the OU ROTC program, sustaining this proud tradition at OU for years to come. The impact of the Mulva's gift is already noticeable. Just over half of their investment was used to revitalize the OU Armory, upgrading this historic landmark that has proudly stood as a cornerstone of service, leadership development, and civic duty at OU for over a century. The gift also created a scholarship endowment that is already supporting ROTC students at OU today and will continue funding opportunities for many future generations. Although Jim's life and career took him to places all over the world, his extraordinary generosity to OU makes it clear he has not forgotten his formative time here, nor the young people who would come after him and follow in his footsteps of service and leadership. Because of this, we are pleased to present this honorary degree from the University of Oklahoma to James Mulva. Jim, would you please come forward? Thank you very much. 
I will now read an excerpt from his honorary degree citation. James Mulva, you have credited your time in the OUROTC as a formative experience that gave you a solid foundation for your future career in the United States Navy and in the corporate world. In 2018, you and your wife Miriam announced a transformational $20 million gift in support of OU's ROTC programs, safeguarding the rich tradition of these programs and sustaining them for future generations. A monumental tribute to all of those in the OU family who have honorably served our nation. The gift through the Mulva Family Foundation will have far-reaching impact and has been used to create a scholarship endowment and to renovate the historic OU Armory. Jim, we are sincerely looking forward to honoring you this evening at the commencement ceremony. Congratulations. Good afternoon. Thank you, President Harris, for such a unique, special, and uh, I'm most pleased for this honorary degree. I never expected it, but uh, it's really quite a, a highlight of my life. So you saw the video and some of the pictures. I'd like to put a little bit more color into that. And the reason I provide a little bit more color is to try to uh, say in a different way why University of Oklahoma and the state of Oklahoma is so important to me and our family. So I grew up and graduated from high school in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And so uh, my father, parents would like me to stay in the area, but I really wanted to reach out and do something different. So to do that, I needed to find some financial assistance, scholarships, and what I really came upon, which to me was unique, was the Navy ROTC program. And the Navy ROTC said, you're gonna go to the University of Oklahoma. So I was assigned to the University of Oklahoma, and when I uh, came here, I didn't know a single person at the university. And, uh, you know, leaving in August of 1964 from the frozen tundra <laughs> to over a 100 degree heat in August in an on air conditioned dorm was, was something uh, different. Anyway, got into the Navy ROTC program, and at the very beginning, you don't really know your way around. It is somewhat intimidating, to say the least but I quickly learned that I had some, some of the best friends of my life. We came together, we started to learn the importance of traditions of the Navy. Certainly this classic program at OU was, was strenuous and very, very good. But my friendship with my fellow midshipmen in the Navy ROTC, we started to learn the history of the Navy and uh, things about leadership and how they develop people and commitment. And to this day, I'd have to say I'm, I'm most proud that I, I served, at least for some period of time, as an officer in the, uh, in the U.S. Navy. I'm going to divert just for a moment and call the commanding officers of the Navy and the Air Force over at Table 4 just to stand. We say thank you for what they do. So they represent what they do individually, but they represent collectively what everyone has done in uniform in the past and what is they're currently doing. So I went in the Navy, and my first assignment was in Commander Middle East Force Staff in Bahrain Island. And I learned a lot very quickly about politics, oil, a different part of the world. And then my, so that was interesting to me. It was also during the time period toward the end of the Vietnam War era. Promotions were backing up. Uh, morale wasn't the greatest. And so I was then signed. My next tour of duty was Navy Finance Center in Cleveland, Ohio. So I made the decision that as well as I liked the four years in the Navy, I thought I'd embark upon something new and different in the corporate world. One of the things why I, I, I want to bring up 
coincidence. You know, we all have coincidence in our life. My second year at OU, I started my first courses in business. It was on the second or third floor, is it Evans Building? Right over across from the armory. And they, you had to, I always made sure I was at class, ahead of class, and they had pictures of manufacturing complexes, headquarters, whatever, and outside of that, they had a picture of what was called the Phillips Building in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And I looked at that and said, wow, that's a pretty unique place. That's interesting. So I go in the Navy, go to the Middle East, go to the Navy Finance Center and decide I'm going to go in the corporate world. Wife Miriam, she types up, I'm saying 15 to 20 uh, of my resumes and sent it to the largest commercial banks in the east and west coast and to, to the larger, say, largest 10 oil companies. The idea being you be an international banker or to be in finance or whatever, an you know, oil company. As I took, and this was in Cleveland, Ohio, and I took the, not the resumes, and I just about threw them in the mailbox, and I said, it's Phillips Petroleum. Interviewed by Phillips, and that's where I went. Went to Phillips Petroleum. So, I started, my first start was at OU in the NROTC program. Went to Bartlesville, and that was the start of a corporate career. And when I went to Bartlesville, I had a really, some very good friends that we don't see very much anymore, and they're sitting at table four too. So Bill and Linda Elfsom, stand up a minute. Say. So Bill and myself started at Phillips Petroleum, same time. We had Stephen, our son, so Bill had a car, wasn't married, and he picked me up in the morning and go to work. But Bill was dating Linda, and he'd stay out awfully late. And I wonder, is he going to make it? He's not going to. I said, Bill, you got to, we got to get to work on time, or we're, they're not going to have us. But we both survived, and it was a just a great experience working in Phillips, and then ultimately Conoco Phillips. We went from Bartlesville to London, back to Bartlesville, back to London, back to Bartlesville to Houston. And what a, a tremendous and a really great experience. So thank you very much for this special honor, President. And I hope I've given a little bit of color. By the way, one last thing. When I worked for almost 22 and a half years, in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, every assignment I had for Phillips Petroleum in Bartlesville was in that Phillips building. The same picture I saw on the second. <laughs> now, isn't, I mean, people talk about coincidences, but I never for forget that. So for the reasons I just mentioned, University of Oklahoma, Navy ROTC, Phillips Petroleum Company have been so special and so good to me and to our family. Thank you. I was going to try and avoid commentary, but it's impossible. Um, Jim, that Phillips building that you saw that inspired you, that you ultimately worked in, that's, you know, that is you seeing something that you didn't think was possible and then it became true. And that really is the primary purpose behind honoring those five individuals today. You all are the ones that our students look at and say, this can be possible, right, to have a life like these five that are here today. Um, so thank you. We're grateful. All right, now please, your, uh, please turn your attention again to the screen as Dr. Todd Fuller, curator of the Western History Collection and faculty member in the Department of English, presents a video introduction of our second recipient, R. Lynn Riggs. It could be said that R. Lynn Riggs thrust the state of Oklahoma onto the world stage his 1931 play, Green Grow the Lilacs, became the basis and source material for one of the most popular musicals of all time, Oklahoma, a Rodgers and Hammerstein production which earned a Pulitzer Prize in 1944. 
It was lilacs that first told the story of early farm life in Oklahoma, even before it became a state in 1907, mirroring Lynn's own upbringing as a Cherokee citizen southwest of Claremore, where he was born in 1899. Lynn went on to attend the University of Oklahoma in 1920 until 1923, and later left his mark on 20th century literature, film, and stage with his extensive body of work. He was a formative player in American modernism, drama, and popular culture, sharing bills with Eugene O'Neill and George Bernard Shaw. Many now recognize the themes he explored in his writing as being ahead of their time, particularly his 1932 play, The Cherokee Night. Issues he raised in the play were felt to be too sensitive and too controversial for audiences at the time. His thoughts on generational divides and lost heritage among the Cherokee people were key themes. Today, we recognize Lynn's powerful understanding of societal and personal challenges we're still facing. The playwright and poet wrote 37 plays during his life, with six making it to Broadway and six original Hollywood screenplays in the 1930s and 40s. It was while serving as a Guggenheim Fellow early in his career that he produced a collection of poetry, The Iron Dish. An acclaimed poet, his work was published in many of the most prestigious literary journals in the country. Lynn passed away in 1954 in New York City, but no matter how far he roamed on stage or onto Hollywood sets, Lynn's voice was distinctly Oklahoman. One reviewer of Lynn's dramas in the 1920s noted that his work smacks of the soil where he was born and bred. We couldn't say it better. And this honorary degree from the University of Oklahoma is more than fitting for a man who celebrated our state throughout his career and took it with him all his life. Thanks and congratulations, Lynn. Fantastic. Mr. Riggs is being, uh, is being awarded posthumously. Representing him and the Riggs family uh, today is his niece, Edri Riggs Doman. Edri, would you please come forward? I will now read an excerpt from Lynn Riggs' honorary degree citation. Born in, Indi born in Indian Territory in 1899, near present-day Claremore, Cherokee citizen Raleigh Lynn Riggs became internationally recognized for his literary works depicting both the allure and the tragedy of pioneer life, with underlying messages that still resonate today. After attending the University of Oklahoma from 1920 to 1923, he embarked on a prolific career as a poet, playwright, screenwriter, and drama theorist. Early in his career, he wrote Green Grow the Lilacs, a play that premiered on Broadway and became the basis for Roger and Hammerstein's epic musical, Oklahoma. During his lifetime, he penned a total of 37 plays, six of which were produced on Broadway, and he was inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame in 1948. Lynn Riggs passed away in 1954. Edri, we look forward to recognizing your uncle's enduring and wide-ranging contributions to the American story this evening at commencement. Thank you. Thank you, President Harris. Honorary recipients and honored guests. I'd like to take a moment to thank those who worked so hard to bring this wonderful day to fruition. Uh, Todd Fuller, Craig Hill, Andy Couch, President Harris, as well as the OU Board of Regents, the OK State Board of Regents. Thank you to the Board of Directors at Claremore Museum of History, the staff at the McFarland Library at the University of Tulsa, Dennis Neal of the Tulsa Equity Center, and most importantly, the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, Chuck Hoskin, Jr. Anyway, even though uh, Lynn Riggs is often listed as a prolific playwright, poet, genius, gay writer, cowboy, Guggenheim fellow, he was known to me and my family simply as Uncle Lynn. We were proud of his accomplishments, 
but the friendship that he and my dad, Joe Van Riggs, was way more, way, way more. He was fun and funny. I look at all of his photos and portraits, and they all belie the fact that he had a wicked sense of humor and a deep, gravelly voice. My parents were in New York during the Oklahoma opening in 1943 while waiting for Dad to ship out during World War II, so they were able to take part in so much of the goings-on of the opening. Uncle Lynn had them often for dinner at his little Greenwich Village apartment where my, my 21-year-old mother tried to look cool while trying to cook beets in an old coffee pot. <laughs> the dining table was a door laid across over a bathtub in the kitchen. It was always a, a night of not so great food, but a lot of hilarity. Uncle Lynn invited his much-loved sister, Maddie, to New York for the opening. She brought along their father, even though they all hadn't really spoken for years. Lynn's upbringing was difficult, to say the least. His mother died when he was a toddler, and his father married a very difficult woman, <laughs> my grandmother. <laughs> He was often shut into an outbuilding on the ranch more than once as a toddler. She was difficult. His big sister Maddie would bring him food secretly, shove it under the door apparently. His father Bill Riggs, my grandfather, was a cruel man and wanted a manly man for a son to drive cattle and do all the things that the cowboys are supposed to do. His father wasn't Cherokee, but he used the family's allotment to add to his own ranch to his cattle ranch. Lynn had to take out a loan against his own allotment to attend college as his father refused to loan him the money. Bill didn't approve of his life or his lifestyle and again was known for his cruelty. Even though Lynn managed to borrow monies in order to get to Paris on a Guggenheim Fellowship where he wrote Green Grow the Lilacs, which we all know became the famous Oklahoma. He's been hailed as the great Cherokee poet and his play, The Cherokee Night, reflected the same difficulties facing indigenous families and communities today. Education was very important to Uncle Lynn. He spoke highly of his time here at Norman and the lifelong friends that he made. Much of his poetry reflected that. I know, and my family knows, that Uncle Lynn would have been so very pleased to receive this great honor after all these years. Thank you so much. Wow, just, Ed Reed, thank you for, I was just saying, thank you for sharing that with all of us. I thought that was incredibly moving uh, and important. Uh, I'm sure your, uh, your uncle, uh, wherever he is, is proud of you. Thanks. All right. We will now hear, no surprise, from former Regent OU Max Weisenhofer uh, in a video introduction of our next honorary degree recipient, Susan Stroman. When I think of Susan Stroman, the word that most often comes to mind is fearless. A five-time Tony Award-winning director and choreographer, Susan is one of the most celebrated and prolific musical theater artists on Broadway today. She is best known for critically acclaimed Broadway hits like Crazy For You, Contact, The Scottsboro Boys, and of course The Producers, which took home a record 12 Tony Awards. Susan's work has earned her many other accolades as her stagings are richly infused with imagination, energy, and precision. But it's Susan's unique ties to OU that brings her today's honor. Susan came to OU in 2017 as a guest artist in residence in the Weitzenhofer School of Musical Theater. Her investment in our students and our musical theater program during her visit not only meant so much back then, it continues to impact our students, faculty, and alumni today, helping elevate OU musical theater to even higher national stature. Over the past few years, she has continually made herself available to our School of Musical Theater and our faculty for advice, consultation, and mentoring. 
She has maintained professional relationships with a number of OU graduates, hiring many of them to be part of her team. Her ties to OU have also helped inspire other high-profile theater professionals to visit campus, in turn generating even more opportunities for our students. There's so much that can be said about the talent Susan brings to the stage, but what has truly left the biggest mark on OU musical theater are the lessons she's shown to our students. Simply by being herself. Work hard, take chances, be kind, be fearless. So many of our students see themselves in Susan Stroman, someone who grew up with big dreams and a yearning to share those gifts with the world. Susan, thank you for showing us that when hard work meets fearless desire to follow your passion, the possibilities are endless. We are ever appreciative and we are thrilled to present you this honorary degree from the University of Oklahoma and congratulations. I will now read uh, an excerpt from Susan's honorary degree citation. Susan Stroman, among your many honors are five Tony Awards, and in your four decades as a Broadway director and choreographer, you are best known for Crazy For You, Contact, The Scottsboro Boys, as well as The Producers, which won a record 12 Tony Awards. Your ties to the University of Oklahoma began in 2017 when you served as a guest artist in residence in the Weisenhofer School of Musical Theater. During your visit, fine arts students had the opportunity to learn from you, a master, firsthand. And the impact of your visit continues today. In recent years, you have continually made yourself available to the Weisenhofer School of Musical Theater and its faculty for advice, consultation, and mentoring. The impact of your time at OU continues to benefit students, faculty, and alumni today, helping to elevate the OU School of Musical Theater to even greater heights. Susan, we are so proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Max. You made me cry up there. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Ah, thank you to everybody here at the University of Oklahoma. I am so delighted to be here. To have one's work and accomplishments recognized is a feeling beyond words, and I am most grateful to all who saw fit to bring me here today. I am very fortunate to do what I love. Even as a child, I knew I would someday, someday become a choreographer and a director. My father was a gifted pianist and a teller of big fish stories. To this day, I don't know if any of them were really true. But our home was filled with music, and I was that little kid who danced to her father playing the piano. He would play, and I would make up stories and dance around the living room. So it was meant to be that I became Susan Stroman. <laughs> Telling stories is how we make sense of the world. Nothing makes me happier than being a part of creating stories that affect an audience. Theater is a living and breathing life force. Sitting in the back of a theater and feeling the emotion of an audience reacting to something I created fills my heart with love. There is no art form quite like the theater because creating theater is all about collaboration. You find a team of people and develop work together. You collaborate to make everyone's work better. You all have a desperate passion to make a show work. And you are all in the swimming pool together, swimming to the end, and either you all win a medal together or you all drown together. <laughs> but regardless of the outcome, you are all in it together. To the graduates that are here today, you are bravely entering a world that has changed since you first set foot on this campus. And your time here has given you tools and the self-assurance to pursue your dreams and a network of your peers who will support you as you set out to discover your place in this world. And I say to you, collaborate like we do in the theater. Surround yourself with good people. 
Immerse yourself in learning about everything around you and let those experiences expand your mind. And steer clear of anyone who might stifle your creativity. My time here teaching a master class was unforgettable. Seeing the talents and the confidence exuding from these young people pursuing the arts, I recognize just how amazing the faculty is here at the university. I applaud all of you. You are preparing these students not only for their artistic careers, but also for a life of good outside these walls. I am pleased and proud to now be a part of this great institution, and I accept this honor as a reminder that we all have a responsibility to bring good to everything we do. Whether you're a choreographer or a director or a writer or a teacher, whatever your passion is, find your team and work together. Discover what you can do and what you're capable of. Empower those around you to make a change and make it your responsibility to create room for the voices you see missing in the world. Don't be afraid. The people who are the absolute best at what they do, the people who you aspire to be, all possess the same traits. They are fearless. Never be scared to take a chance. Or as my good friend Mel Brooks said, don't tap the bell, ring the bell. <laughs> take a chance and say yes. Everyone here in this room have made it this far because we are all extraordinary in some way. So as my colleague Stephen Sondheim used to toast, here's to us who's like us, damn few. Thank you for this incredible honor. Now that was special. <laughs> I did not see the singing coming and it was amazing. Sondheim, Brooks, all also friends of mine. <laughs> right, just to lay a couple names out there. I do want you to know I've been a fan of the producers for a really long time. I've watched it several times um, and it is, it, it is so great to actually meet you. Uh, but I have to admit something, which is before I was a fan of yours and the producers, I was a fan of our next recipient. Uh, as an Oklahoman, it was, it was a necessity. We will now hear from Joe Castiglione, Vice President of Intercollegiate Athletics and uh, Director of Athletics, and a video introduction of our next honorary degree recipient, Mr. J.C. Watts. A native of Eufaula, Oklahoma, J.C. Watts has said that Eufaula gave him his roots, but the University of Oklahoma gave him his wings. J.C. is an OU legend in so many ways and to so many people. Over the years, he's laid claim to a number of titles, congressman, business leader, minister, and of course, Sooner quarterback. His accomplishments are simply remarkable. But these successes didn't just happen by chance. They happened because of his tenacity, his grit, and his courage. It's these values that were instilled in him back home in Eufaula. After the second time JC left the OU football team his freshman year, his father motivated him with this reminder. If what you're doing was easy, everybody would be doing it. Drawing on his wisdom, and with a little encouragement from Coach Switzer, J.C. made the ultimate comeback. Leading the Sooners to back-to-back -back Orange Bowl victories and being named MVP both times. After graduating from OU with a degree in journalism, grinding it out in professional football, and becoming a youth minister, in 1990, he was elected to the Oklahoma Corporation Commission becoming the first African-American elected to a statewide office in Oklahoma. Four years later, he again made history, becoming Oklahoma's first black United States representative. In Congress, his colleagues quickly took note of his leadership qualities, selecting him to serve in House leadership as chair of the House Republican Conference. During his eight years in Congress, he also served on several House committees, and he authored meaningful legislation to better our country. 
JC's post-congressional career has seen continued success, leading to his current position as chairman, president, and CEO of JC Watts Holdings and his role as chairman of the Black News Channel. In each of these chapters, all along the way, the common thread has been his integrity, his passion, and his determination. All of this makes J.C. Watts an especially worthy recipient of the honorary degree from the University of Oklahoma. J.C., you are Sooner Magic. Congratulations. And as you might guess, it's now time to read an excerpt, I know, of the honorary, you know, I may just read the whole thing with that kind of a reaction. All right, I will now, I will now read an excerpt um, from the citation. J.C. Watts, you became a household name in Oklahoma as one of Owens Field's greatest champions, and later as a visionary leader who rose to the highest levels of government. While at OU, you gained national recognition as a starting quarterback for the Sooners, leading the team to back-to-back -back Orange Bowl victories in 1980 and 1981. After retiring from football and returning to Oklahoma, you served seven years as a youth pastor. You made history in 1994 when you successfully ran for Congress, becoming Oklahoma's first black United States representative. During your time in Congress, you authored meaningful legislation to better our nation. J.C., you have devoted so much of your life to helping and serving the people of Oklahoma while never shying away from your enthusiastic support of the alma mater that loves you. Thank you and congratulations. Mr. President, Board of Regents, and all who made this possible today, I thank you, and I also say congratulations to all of the other honorees. Uh, Mr. President, you said earlier you were talking about people being smarter than you. My dad told me once, he said, when you, when you hire people that's smarter than you are, you prove you're smarter than they are. All those students, to all those students with four-point uh, GPAs uh, throughout your academic career, I've got two words for you: show-offs. <laughs> you know, my church family is here with me today, and my family and friends that I created through politics, um, my Ufala. Oklahoma family, some of them is here today, and of course, um, my Watts family, my brother and his wife, and uh, my wife of 45 years as of May 7th, just a week ago, and they're all here with me today, and, and um, you know, I've had the opportunity to wear my University of Oklahoma cap, whether it had the OU emblem on it or not, I always wore the Sooner cap wherever I was, around the country, around the nation. I was proud to represent the University of Oklahoma, uh, my, my alma mater, and for them, for you all to do this today, I am truly, truly, truly honored. Back in 1976, February 3rd, actually, 1976, Barry Switzer, Coach Barry Switzer invited me to become a member of the Sooner family. And I signed a letter of intent to attend the University of Oklahoma, and I came up here, and the first month was just, I hated it. And the, the second month, I hated it more. And um, I packed my bags, and I went home 
you fall Oklahoma net with, ten, with intentions of never returning to Norman, Oklahoma. Gary Morris, who is in the audience today, and his wife Kathy, called Coach Lucius Selman and said, J.C. has quit and he's not going to return to Norman and he thinks he's going to go somewhere else. Coach Selman talked to Coach Switzer. Coach Switzer called me and said, look, come back. Let's talk about it. Um, and if you still like, feel like you want to quit and want to leave, I'll give you a release to go wherever you want to go. So I packed my bags, came back to Norman, and talked to Coach Switzer, and his words to me were, you've got a future here. If you stay, you'll play. And we're going to redshirt you next year. You'll come off a red shirt as a backup. you start for two years, and you'll have a nice career at the University of Oklahoma. In the meantime, when I was talking to my dad in Eufaula, he said to me before I came back to talk to Coach Switzer, he said, um, you're of age that you need to make these decisions on your own. And he said, but I will tell you one thing. If what you're doing was easy, everybody would be doing it. Some of that registered. I came back to Norman. I matured. I grew up a little bit. Um, went to class. And by the way, Mr. President, if, I've, if I would have known this was coming, I wouldn't have gone to class back then. <laughs> Went to class, grew up a little bit, redshirted my second year, came off redshirt, is back up and started for two years. I am grateful that Gary Moores ratted me out to Coach Switzer, that Coach Switzer called me and said, come back, let's talk about it. You've got a future at the University of Oklahoma. The rest is history. I understand that in 1890, when David Ross Boyd was invited to become the first president of the University of Oklahoma, he came down from Kansas on a train, and he looked out over all this pasture land, and he didn't say, what possibilities? He said, what possibilities? That statement encompassed the fifth child of six kids born to J.C. Watts Sr. and Helen Watts. What possibilities, because of what was created, created on these grounds, gave me an opportunity in 1976 to come to school here get my degree in May of 1981, continue on and serve as a youth pastor and uh, went to Congress and served in state government. Oklahoma has been, has been extremely, extremely good to J.C. Watts. Mr. President, you all have done a whole lot more for me than I will ever be able to do for the University of Oklahoma. But I will tell you, no one wears their Sona cap more proudly than J.C. Watts. Thank you so much. It's always nice to honor one of your childhood heroes until you realize they look younger than you do. I didn't hear a word he said, I'll be honest. I just <laughs> kept obsessing over that. And by the way, um, through the work of David Surratt and others, we have improved the uh, first year, first two-month experience at OU. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, speaking of amazing opportunities, one of the really great things about this job, and there are a bunch, is that you get to look at short lists of individuals that could be your commencement speaker. And when that short list came forward to me and, and David Brooks was on there, uh, there is no question what the right answer is. He's one of the great public intellectuals. Uh, he's a commentator that I have followed for a good number of years, one of the true thought leaders that we have in this country. 
Uh, let's now turn to the screens and hear Ed Kelly, Dean of the Gaylord College of Journalism and Mass Communications, in a video introduction of our next honoree, Mr. David Brooks. Through his writing, David Brooks has dedicated his intellectual life to challenging all of us to live deeper, more meaningful lives. His best-selling books and widely read opinion columns have impacted culture, politics, and the social sciences, placing him among the most admired authorities on modern society. His informed and insightful pieces are examples of his broad global perspective, gleaned over his four decades as a journalist, a career that's taken him all over the world. After rising in the ranks of the Wall Street Journal and the Weekly Standard, David joined the New York Times in 2003 as an op-ed columnist, writing on topics that intimately touch our lives, like the art of friendship and the nature of identity, to global issues related to U.S. foreign policy and the perils of the information age. His New York Times best-selling books include The Road to Character and The Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life. He explores how selflessness inspires more success and it reveals through personal stories the attributes that create greater meaning and purpose. He's a regular contributor to the PBS NewsHour and NPR's All Things Considered, and has been a contributing editor at Newsweek and the Atlantic Monthly. David's mission throughout his career, to speak to the soul of Americans by lighting a path toward richer, more satisfying lives, has cemented his legacy, a legacy that rings true here at OU, where each of us strives to live out those principles. His message is important as ever for our students as we aim to prepare them for a life of meaning, service, and positive impact. His moral imperatives resonate with our mission to become a place of belonging and emotional growth for all who are part of the OU family. As a commentator and writer, David calls on all of us to reach for a higher purpose, a higher level of generosity of spirit. His roadmap to guide us there highlights the significance of our personal relationships and he urges us to find joy in life's small but touching moments. Because of his perspective of community and his devotion to principles of selflessness and purpose, it is our privilege to present to David Brooks an honorary degree from the University of Oklahoma. Because of the pace of commencement weekend, he has been spared having dinner with me. Um, and so that's something for which you should be grateful. Um, an excerpt from the degree citation reads as follows. David Brooks, as one of the nation's leading critical thinkers, you're widely respected for your thoughtful analysis and keen observations of the American way of life. Best known as an op-ed columnist for the New York Times, a position you have held since 2003. You have also authored several critically acclaimed books. Your writings and commentary explore culture, politics, and the social sciences, inspiring your audiences to build community and seek a life of purpose. David, your insight challenges us to pursue a meaningful life marked by humility, togetherness, and compassion. We look forward to hearing you deliver our commencement address at this year's Class of 2022 commencement, and we proudly recognize you tonight with a Doctor of Humane Letters, David Brooks. So I made the mistake of reading my first book for books on tape uh, myself, and one thing you learn when you read your own book out loud is how incredibly boring large parts of it are. Um, but I, I did get one story that sound engineer told me he was once recording a novelist who had written a 700-page novel that he had to read aloud for books on tape. Uh, and in the middle of the reading, the sound engineer looked into the booth, and the guy was weeping. And so he pushed the button and said, is there something wrong? Is there something I can help you with? And the novelist said, don't I ever shut up? <laughs> um, and so I, I'm going to get to talk a little later tonight, so I won't detain you. Uh, too long, just to make three quick points about why it was so important and why it was such an honor to come here. First, I love being around college students, and graduation days are just happy days, and it's just a pleasure to share the joy of the students and the families and be present for that. 
My college was uh, the University of Chicago. The famous saying about Chicago, it's where fun goes to die. Uh, but the better saying about it is it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and, and I think about my college education has more impact on me now, decades on, than it did the day I left. And I'm sure the folks who are older can remember how the seeds that get planted grow. So just to be with Megan and Parker here at our table and to be with the students, it's just an honor to be involved in any university. Universities, especially ones like this one that provide so much social mobility, are some of the healthiest institutions in our society right now. And anything we can do to support them is worth doing. Second, it was a pleasure to get to go to Oklahoma. I grew up in New York City, a somewhat different location. I saw my first cow when I was 16. Uh, <laughs> Uh, though my great uncle was a guy named Irving Browning who directed movies. Uh, he directed silent movies. In those days, they made the silent movies on the beach in Atlantic City. They needed a lot of light. And he directed westerns. And so if you went to his apartment, a place called Morningside Heights in New York, it looked like you were walking into Montana in 1860. There were powder horns, lassos, all the western paraphernalia. The guy never went west of the Hudson River in his entire life. But he had this romanticism about the West, and it was a romanticism about America. And I've had a chance to be out here in Norman, occasionally go to a place in Stillwater, uh, uh, and just a chance to be in Oklahoma has always been a pleasure to me, a pleasure to see the heart of our great country, to feel a place that feels to, still feels so young. And so I'm getting to enjoy that. And finally, I just wanted to, a realization came to me 20 minutes or so ago while Susan was speaking. And she was talking about the fun she has making shows. I was thinking back to this morning, sitting in a room alone at the embassy suites writing, which did not seem as much fun. <laughs> and I, when I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear and decided at that moment I wanted to become a writer. And I've pretty much written a thousand words every single day in the 50 years since then. And writing has always been core to my values. I remember in high school, I wanted to date this woman named Bernice. She didn't want to date me, she wanted to date some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. <laughs> so that was the core. <laughs> but it is a solitary life. Uh, and being a Washington pundit is sort of solitary and emotionless. Washington is the most emotionally avoidant city on the face of the earth. But about 15 years ago, I got invited by a friend of mine who works at a theater, Susan knows, I'm sure, the Public Theater in New York, which originated Hamilton and other things. And they asked me to be a pa on a panel with a bunch of actors, including Anne Hathaway was one of them. So we're backstage, and before the panel, we do a group hug. It's like, oh, let's all put on a show. And then we get out there, there's tissues in case we're going to start crying. And then we get off stage, we do another group hug. It was like being part of a team. And I always thought, I should have gone into show business. <laughs> and so I'm announcing that I'm retiring from the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to become a choreographer. What the hell? <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> It's funny, Susan doesn't look threatened. <laughs> David, thank you so much. Um, so our last two speakers spoke to David Ross Boyd, what possibilities. We had the seed sowing reference, uh, which ties in perfectly. Um, and, and before we get to the conclusion that we have to all major events, uh, I just want all five of you to know um, the kind of examples you are to all of us and all of the students that are here. And tonight, when we recognize you and make you officially Oh, you doctorates of humane letters. I just want you to know what that broadcasts to all of the students that are there and all of those uh, of us that are part of the OU family. It means a great deal, and we are sincerely grateful. All right. And now, um, we end every event uh, as we do. We're going to end with the OU chant, and I'd invite Kayla Marshall to lead us in the singing of the OU chant. Earlier last week, it wasn't Kayla, but another singer didn't show up. I was in front of a large crowd, I'm tone deaf, and I led the chant. 
That will never happen again. Kayla, please come up. Just so you'll know, Kayla is a senior vocal performing major who plans to continue her education at OU, getting a master's in musicology. Please welcome Kayla Marshall. 